So anyway, uh, the purpose is to talk about the topic and giving you some uh, information what I have learned the, myself about this wonderful topic. So if the purpose is fulfilled, I think the thing is done. All right. I hope you agree with me. All right. Okay. So uh, today's presentation is about a way of teaching where we teach students how to analyze their own thinking. So in other words, it's called metacognition. Metacognition is usually defined as thinking about thinking, cognition about cognition, but it's more than that. And this, uh, this definition, thinking about thinking itself is quite, quite ambiguous, quite uh, simplified, rather oversimplified. There, there, there's meaning to that. So uh, I would like to start with four uh with one scenario with four different teachers and i would like you to I, I would like you to answer one question at the end of it let's start with scenario and uh so if you can uh if you can see my screen this scenario was explained by markia as uh Peter Nets in 2016 in her paper i i uh um, I took the idea from there. It's just okay. You can see on the screen one uh, teacher. She's monitoring her class. Her name is Miss Pearson. She tells the students to read the chapter from a textbook, and she gives them the time to read in the class. Next scenario. On the same day, in the same school, the same subject, but another teacher, Mr. Samuels. He allows his students class time to read the chapter, but he also gives them a worksheet to complete as they read. So he tells them, okay, fill the sheet, send it in when you're done. We will talk about it tomorrow and see how well you understand the chapter. Okay. Now the worksheet has a minute on the screen at the top corner, top left corner. Uh, and there are like, uh, there are four founding fathers of America listed at the top. And then there are some categories which the students have to think about or read about and then uh, fill up uh, this uh, organizer with information about their birth date, death date, nickname, uh, professions, offices held and document signed. Okay, let's move to scenario number three. Now, the same subject, same worksheet, another teacher uh, on the same day, his name is Mr. Jordan. Let's see how he is dealing with the same worksheet and with the same topic. The topic is uh, for uh, founding fathers of America and their history, their uh biograph biographical information about okay so mr jordan gives students the same worksheet and time to read the chapter in class however uh he lets them to begin working uh, as he gives them information he says let's look at the different topics and categories in this matrix organizer you can see that the top row lists several founding fathers such as george washington thomas jefferson and benjamin Franklin. Inkling. You can also see the left column lists categories such as birthdays, death, death date, and nicknames. Now, now that we know that what's on the matrix organizer, matrix organizer, let's look at the chapter. Follow along with me as action about George Washington. George Washington was born on February 22, 2nd, 1732, in Westmoreland County, Virginia. I remember that birth date is category in my matrix. So I'm going to write 1732 in the cell that connects George Washington and birth rate. As you read, look for information that corresponds to the topics and categories in the, mat in the matrix. By the end of the chapter, you should have. So this is all what he tells his students. So. He is giving a lot of instructions. How to work with the matrix organizer, uh, what he is expecting from them. And he also read a little part from, and he gave one example. Let's move to the last 
uh, teacher in the same scenario. Okay, here uh, we have Miss Andrews. She has a similar worksheet, but what she has done, she has made some changes. She removed the professions, offices held, and documents signed. So she has only three things, three categories, birth date, death date, nicknames, uh, and then what she tells the students. Uh, look at just, okay, let's listen with with me her instructions. This table is called a matrix. It has rows and columns that can be used to organize any information that compares two or more topics along one or more categories to make it easier to remember information and see relationships within that information. When creating a matrix, we put the topics on top. As you can see, the topics of this chapter include names of founding fathers. The categories in the leftmost column are the characteristics to compare the topics. You can see I have given you a few example categories, birth date, death date, and nicknames. I left some of the boxes in that column blank because you need to generate a few categories of your own. After you read each paragraph, be sure to ask yourself, can I put anything from that paragraph in my matrix? If you pause after each paragraph, you will be more likely to capture all of the important details in your matrix. Once you have finished reading the chapter and have completed your matrix, you will have an excellent study tool that you can use to study for the next test. It should be easy for you to see the similarities fostering metacognition and differences among these founding fathers and seeing that those relationships will help you better understand the roles they played in a all right so i hope uh, i hope you understood all these three four teachers work and method uh can i hear a yes yes okay thank you all right okay so now let's move to the question okay the question is in which scenario the teaching math supports the student learning so you can unmute yourself uh, and you can answer this question Do you think Ms. Pearson was successful in supporting students' learning? Or Mr. Samuels? Mr. George? Mr. Andrews? Or none of above? The option can be also written in the chat box. It will be read out to Mr. Fayaz. Thank you. Take a minute. Take a minute and uh, think about who has made the learning opportunity best for students which teaching method best supports student learning maha says it's d all right okay uh let's wait for a couple of more answers nilifer thinks it's a Okay, we will talk about the problems, the issues uh, in these four methods. Sure. So, anybody else? We have more Ds. Option D. Mm -hmm. Clara thinks it's option D. All right. Right, exactly. So, everyone, for answering this question. Um, okay. Uh, it is yes. It is. It is Miss Andrews. She 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 built up. She built up the best uh, teaching scenario. Or uh, uh, anything else. She didn't provide them with any, uh, you can say that, uh, any, any support system uh, with any tool of learning, with anything to work further. We, we, we don't know what happened next. Okay. Mr. Samuels, what he did? Yes, uh, he provided students with a tool. That is a worksheet. He explained them um, some few very, very basic things about this worksheet and the lesson like that, but he did not model it. He did not. He did not provide an example. 
uh, for, for, for them, to, for, for students to get encouraged to, to find the good answers to work on their own. He did not do much to make them independent learners. All right. Uh, in third scenario, Mr. Jordan. Mr. Jordan uh, went ahead. He, he, he explained the whole uh, worksheet categories, their purpose, why they have to use them, uh, the aim of this whole thing, this whole activity. And then uh, he actually modeled it. He modeled it. He, he did not, uh, so he was, uh, he read a part of it. He picked up one piece of information and he filled it in one uh, box in the matrix organizer and then he uh, gave them one very good practical example how to complete that and then he explained the benefit the benefit of uh, uh, doing this he guided the future path for the students that what will be the benefit if they, if they follow this method so uh, he was very successful in creating an, an opportunity for students to, to, uh, to, to be an independent learner, to work independently on this worksheet. But the best approach was from Ms. Andrews. What she did, she made students aware. She made students aware of the technique, the strategy that they're going to use. She made them aware that they are going to use a matter cognition and uh, not only that, but she also explained the use of this thing, the, uh, how to use that, what is inside that matrix, that uh, or information organizer. She actually opened a, a kind of opportunity, a door for learners to be independent. She removed three categories. And she asked students to develop their own categories. She's inviting them to think. She's giving them a chance to be creative, to think deeper, to think outside the text. So what, she, what is she doing? She is actually explicitly telling them that they have to use their metacognitive abilities. Uh, they have to understand the reading and not only understand, they have to understand the reading by thinking an extra level about that. They have to go beyond the reading. So they have to, uh, they have to, going beyond, uh, while they go beyond the reading, they have to create something from their own side, from their own mind to make it more meaningful for themselves. And she also explained the benefit. She actually explained them that uh, while following this method of being independent, independently working on that, they will have a lot of benefit of learning and they can apply this strategy in other texts. So, this is thinking about thinking. This is metacognition. Uh, and like, so, uh, uh, do we analyze our thinking process in everyday life? Yes, we do that. We do it in everyday life. We try to we try to think about our weaknesses. We try to uh, reevaluate our actions, our decisions, things that we say to people. Uh, so let's let's look at these five points. So how it happens? It's actually creating awareness that you have difficulty remembering people's names. Social situation, this is one example that we see in everyday life situations. So we remembered first, but now we are aware that we can't recall them. Reminding yourself that you should try to remember the name of the person you just met. It happens, yep. Recognizing that you know an answer to a question, but simply can't recall it at the moment. You know the answer. You cognitively, you read about that, you understood it, but now... About that understanding, you can't recall. Real, number four, realizing that you should review an article you read last week because you have forgotten many of the key points. And realizing that there is something wrong with your solution to a problem. 
So we do it every day. So uh, now let's, uh, now this is the point where we have to think about what are cognitive skills and what are metacognitive skills. So thinking, reading, learning, remembering, reasoning, and paying attention, these are basic cognitive skills. And these are part of our everyday life as well as the education uh, process that we explicitly, implicitly teach in our classes as teachers. So uh, taking all incoming information and storing into the bank of knowledge that we use every day at school, at work, and in life, that is cognitive. That is cognition. So each of these skills, each of the skills in, in, in uh, actually works as an important part in processing new information in everyday life. So what is metacognition? So let's look at the word. Meta mean meta comes from Greek. Meta, meta means beyond. And uh, the Latin word cognizia means getting to know. Beyond knowing, beyond knowing when you when you think about your own thinking, this is Matakar. So, um, cognition is the ability to reflect and critically analyze how you think. But uh, here I would like to make it clear that uh, critical thinking is just one small part of metacognition. Critical thinking is not metacognition. Sometimes uh, these two terms are confused or used like interchangeably, but they're not. They're not. We'll see later how. So what is it? Having self-awareness that enables individuals to monitor, reflect, and analyze their own performance, their own thinking, that is metacognition. The difference. Cognition is like cognition deals with uh, difference of knowledge like memory, learning, problem solving, attention, and decision making. But metacognition is our higher order cognitive process, higher order thinking, where we have an active control on our cognition, on our cognitive skills. So we control problem solving, we control our memory, we control our attention, we control our decision making. So, uh, the founder of metacognitive studies is John Hurley Flavel, or Flavel from Stratford University. He actually laid the basics for these things. His inspiration actually came from when he started working around 70s, uh, right, throughout the 70s he worked on that. He started working on children, children uh, theory of mind. Let's see what he did. So, he started working on two things, theory of mind and role taking. So in theory of mind, uh, he explained that children actually develop an understanding in an early stage that people don't share the same thoughts and feeling as they do. Since beyond the age of three, children didn't start developing that the way they think about the outside world, other people don't think like that. So through many experiments, through many experimental to know about uh, this uh, ability of children uh, as a scientific fact. So uh, now what, why it's important, why this understanding of children's ability of thinking about feelings of other people, it's important. Why? Because it turns into, it turns, it, it actually helps them to tune in to other people's perspective. To see things from other people's point of view, to understand other people's uh, ideas. So, but it happens slowly. Uh, when he, while he was doing these experiments, he saw that uh, children from two, three years of age, they did not respond well while he was doing these, these experiments. Uh, the purpose of which was whether they can understand other people's thinking and thoughts or not. But while he, when he started working on children aged three and above, especially 
entire four years, he started having good results. And there um, he came up with these ideas. Children have this ability to understand that the person in front of me is more than a person and he looks at things not the way I look at them. So it takes time. This ability in children to develop takes time. But consequently, when this ability is developed fully, completely, children develop uh, many different types of metacognitive skills. And it happens before they turn five or six. And then they start. They start understand, they, they start understanding and accepting the role of others. So, uh, what are the conclusions? So, he, after a lot of experiments into the theory of mind, he concluded the ability to distinguish between reality and appearance. Children uh, acknowledge that a given object in reality uh, is one thing, yet it appears to be a different thing in another situation, in another, in, in another con uh, context. So, uh, for example, when I go to the class and the class is full of um, five years old, six years old, they don't see an old man having shabby hair, gray hair, or talking crazy or something. They see beyond my physical Appearance, reality, unreal and reality, it develops children quite early. And this, um, this he was, uh, uh, Flawell was studying and experimenting on. So then he came up with this idea that children acquire the notion of mental representation of reality as distinct uh, from reality itself. As a, as a result, children have the ability to monitor their thinking to guide their thinking in a specific way. And they're also able to interpret their own thinking process. One example of this thing is imaginary play. Uh, uh, you, you must have seen children imagining a, uh, a stick as a sword and pretending you're like uh, King Arthur or uh, a fighter or a warrior or something like that. They see on a stick. They see it as as specific in a in, in a completely different context. And they enjoy that experience. They enjoy that experience. They they, they dramatize that situation. They talk to themselves. They um, uh, they they act in a different way uh, while understanding that they are not their own selves. They are something different and they, they feel happy when they put themselves into another self. So this is what he explained. And on the base of that, he came up with this uh, term. He coined the term. Well, coined this term. Uh, I know that these days, children's ability to play with themselves is getting like, is it is disappearing because of all these internet idiots and smart devices and all that, but I wish they could do that, all of that, right, okay. So, uh, now, let's relate, let's relate what Flawell explained to higher thinking. What, what he was saying is actually correspond, uh, is actually corresponding to synthesizing, analyzing, reasoning, comprehending, application, and evaluation. So synthesizing, bringing things from here and there and putting them together into another piece. Going deeper to understand them. Then reasoning with that. Is it good or bad? Then comprehending. Having a final, complete understanding. Then applying it and then evaluating it. Is it useful or not? Should I change it or not? So Flavel's idea actually encompasses all these 
mental abilities. So, and um, this actually corresponds to a higher order skill, the higher order skills with Bloom's taxonomy. Uh, uh, we, we, we hear about that, we, we learn about that, and uh, here we can see the application of Flavell's ideas here. Uh, from building knowledge, going up to evaluation, this, is, this, is, this goes to a specific goal. This goes to a specific purpose of having complete independences. Okay, moving ahead. Uh, so from 70s, and now we jump to 2011. In 2011, Dr. Pina Tarikon developed this theory further. What she did in her book, The Taxonomy of uh, Metacognition, what she did, she actually uh, created a modern kind of taxonomy, which is completely based on metacognition. And uh, she uh, divided it into, into two very distinct sections that we are going to discover in our coming slides. So uh, on the base, on the base, she actually explained it as uh, and three core values, knowledge, awareness, and control of one's own cognition, and uh, control over human cognition, general human understanding. So knowledge, awareness, and control, control over one's own thinking. This is what she came, uh, this is what she came up with. So she divided metacognition into knowledge of cognition and regulation of cognition. So, the knowledge of cognition uh, explained in three categories, declarative, procedural, conditional. Declarative like knowledge related to human learning and one's, one's own self as a learner. That you declare the what I know and what I don't know. What are, my what are my strengths regarding knowledge and what are my weaknesses? When you understand that, you reach that level of knowledge, declarative knowledge of cognition. The next stage is procedural. You process after recognizing that, okay, this much I know and this much I don't know and I have, I have to solve this problem. So the next stage is how to process the, this knowledge, how to look for the, how to generate the abilities, the skills, how to look for the strategies. Once you're able to do that, once you're able to find that strategy, then you have to, why and where you have to apply uh, that strategy, strategy. That is conditional knowledge, right, okay. Once these three conditions are, once th these three stages are over, then she moved. She moved the metacognition to the next stage, regulation, control, awareness. So first she explained planning. So now we have everything. We, we know what our weaknesses, we know what we need to know the process that we have to uh, that we have to adopt and we know the situations where we have to use this information this knowledge so now we have to plan we need to decide what steps to take before doing an activity and then we have to monitor monitor our own self when we while we are are doing that so it is a kind of intentional aware a kind of uh, fully aware Awareness about one's thoughts and attention. Am I paying attention? Are my thoughts, is my work going in the right direction or not? So monitoring, monitoring stage. And then during the monitoring, when you see that there are some hindrances, glitches, problems, you try to control. You try to have a control over uh, those problematic areas. So here, you use your cognitive inhibition to 
constrain thinking, right? You try to remove hurdles. You try to uh, control uh, good things that work. You strengthen them. The problems that block your thinking, you you cancel them. You reject them. And finally, evaluation. Then it's a reflection stage. You reflect, uh, reflecting on one's own work and comparing it to a standard, to a rubric, to a, to a high standard bar, to a benchmark. Did I reach the benchmark in my reading, in my writing, in my research, in my career at that? I did. Uh, she actually divided metacognition into these two levels, uh, and we will see their application now. So it is a journey between concrete knowledge and moving on to abstract knowledge. So in, on this scale, on this scale, a learner in, inside the classroom moves from factual, from facts verbal and nonverbal terminology, words, vocabulary, um, ideas, facts, and then he moves, he moves them, he moves to the conceptual stage. Once he has got all the ideas, words, vocabulary, and uh, information, he tries to classify them, categorize them. He tries to derive principles on which these words, grammatical tools, reading, writing, all these things work theories, generalizations, and the relationships between them function together. And once the concepts are clear, then it, he moves to, then the learner moves to the procedural level. Then he, he, he applies different skills, techniques, methods, methods of inquiry, uh, certain algorithms, principles. He applies them practically. And finally, he, he gets himself uh, aware of her own learning. And then he tries to control it. He tries to monitor it, regulate it, uh, this process uh, um, with conditional learning. That where I have to apply that, where I have to apply a part of it or the whole of it. So how I evaluate it. So I hope... So far, the theoretical element is clear to you. Okay. Uh, so from here, we are going to move to the application, how it works in education, how it works in the classroom. So, uh, so, so now we have understood that we can teach. We can teach this process to students at how to learn by fostering metacognition. Uh, that, is, that is like we have to go related to knowledge, awareness, and controlling their own thinking. Uh, when we want to apply it in our classroom, it is an intentionally designed instruction. So all activities, right from the start till to the end, we have to intentionally design them with metacognition as a focus, as a goal. So, uh, and we create opportunities for students so that, um, so that learners can observe their own decisions, their own choices, and make corrections wherever. So it enables students to strategically apply skills and strategies across learning contexts so that they can learn effectively and independently. Some like to do it in implicit ways, some teachers like to do it in explicit ways. So uh, in implicit metacognition instructions, what we do? We model, we provide a model of metacognition cognitive learning to students, and then we prompt students to use metacognition without, without acknowledging it. We don't talk about metacognition itself. We don't use the term for the student. But 
in explicit, what we do, we teach students how and why to use metacognitive learning strategy, and we explain why it is beneficial, and we point out how they could use it in the future. I would like to go back here. I would like to go back here this example. What he was doing, he was providing implicit instruction to kids. He modeled it, he explained the concept, and then uh, uh, he showed them a way how to do that, how to do that. But then he, uh, he, he left them with their own work, with their own understanding. But Mrs. Andrews, what she did, what she did, she explicitly told students, she used the word, she used, and she, she explained uh, the whole thing. She actually created a chance for them to be independent, to be creative. So back here. All right, okay. Uh, I would like to show you a video. It's a three minutes video. You are going to see a classroom. In this classroom, you're going to see a teacher, how, how the teacher is uh, using the word, how she is making, uh, making her students aware of their problems. She's sitting in the center. The children are sitting in, in a half circle around her. Um, try to notice how many times she uses the word metacognition. Let's play it. One, two, three. Excuse me, can you hear the sound? Hello? Yes, it's fine, Mr. Fias. Thank you. All right. Okay. Okay. Students discuss strategies they employ when they encounter unknown words in their reading. These include referring to word walls and comprehension keys posted in the classroom, chunking parts of words, predicting from context, and asking others for help. The teacher emphasizes that these metacognitive strategies help students to gain independence in reading and to set their own next steps as readers. Okay, we are going to read a little piece today that's going to help us practice one of the strategies we use for reading. What do you think about what strategies we use for reading? What do we call it when we're thinking about how we learn? What's that great big word you love so much? Is it Natalie? What's it called? Metacognition. Metacognition. What does that mean? We can even spell it, can't we, guys? Back to the Thinking about your thinking, thinking about your learning. Sometimes when we're reading, we run into difficulties, so we need some help to figure things out. The students are constantly involved in self-evaluation, trying to get them to identify what the next steps in their reading should be. I find that very, very effective for the kids because once they know why they're doing something, then they're much more willing to be part of whatever activity that we come up with. But letting them know the purpose is important, and then they can set their, their next steps. What kind of strategies can we use? when we need some help figuring things out. Cole, what do you use? I use a word wall and I use a word wall. Okay. Oh, you use the word wall and? I use a word wall and a How do you know where those words are, Cole? Sometimes I'm on the word wall sometimes, you know, your arm over there. Or the people help me Good for you. That's well explained. What other strategies do we use when we come to a word we don't know, Natalie? Usually, I look, it's, I kind of kind of stuck on something. I just look up there, mm -hmm. and then I'll, I, I check which ones I can Okay, so you use out. the keys to help you out. Julia? I remember the day we started breaking words into chunks, and we saw how we could spell so well. And that big word that we spelled was metacognition. You couldn't believe we knew how to spell it. What strategies do you like, Evan? Well, sometimes... When I'm reading a book and I and I can't figure it out no matter what, I just don't care if I don't know one word, I just keep reading. Okay, so you try to get the, the information you need on what? I guess what the word is and then I don't use that word. Okay. And sometimes if I know it's not right there and ask someone else for help. Okay, so asking for help's a great one. Cassie? Um well, sometimes in books, 
there's a word. I know how to read it, but I don't know what it means. How many people have that problem? I have that problem all the time. Eric, you told me about having kind of a problem like that last week, but it was all around what? Names, people's names. You could try to sound them out, but you hadn't heard it. You didn't know how to pronounce it. Carry in our books become important then. So what can we do if we don't understand what a word means? Hmm. What can we do? Okay, but they can already read it. You can read a word, but you don't know what it means. Um, what can, Cole? Um, and you might find what it means. To understand what magic vision is, they know their weaknesses. They find out strategies to overcome their weaknesses, and they know what tools they need to use and where to find those tools. They know where the problem lies and they're not alone in it. They're not alone in this in this kind of problem. Uh, so what, when they answer, others get some help as well. They can evaluate themselves, yes. And they know what goals they need to set for themselves. And they know how to ignore other distractions or strategies that, strategies that do not work for them. So uh, this is one, one uh, this is another example here of implicit and explicit methods. So prompting, modeling, direct instructions, and teaching benefits. One example is like the teacher can start, initiate the process of thinking for students like by asking right questions. How did you get your answer? So the student can answer, I know words are long and difficult to remember. So the first thing I'm going to do is to make a list of words check their meanings and see their use in sentences. This is what students are saying. So, or, or the teacher can model it for, for the student. So direct instruction will be, one strategy you can use is to understand the context in the sentence, to understand the closest meaning of the word. If you are aware of understanding the context in the story and in a sentence, you can read a news report, a novel, and many other things without consulting a dictionary. These are the benefits. So <clears throat> combining all that, it will help learners become more independent. Uh, so here is another model for reading, how to teach reading using uh, metacognition, metacognitive skills. So let students, so I have divided this thing into three uh, columns. First column, let them think about the length of the text. So you can ask about it, like how much time it will take to read it and the mental process that will be going on in the heads of learners, time, space, thinking, and they will look at the text. They will tell you, oh, we, we can finish it in five minutes. Self-awareness, planning, right? Okay. Title. Have you read about it before? So they will connect previous knowledge with the title of the book. So then uh, let them think about the organizational structure and how you can prompt it. You can, you can ask, does it look like a story or a news report? So they will look at their reading. They will look at the organizational structure. Is it, is it a narrative or what? So they will navigate for the design elements in the text. They will skim. Are there any pictures, graphs, tables? So they, they will quickly skim the text. They will find it about it. Okay. So, these questions, these strategies, these actions will make them independent learners. And then they can go for comprehension strategies. They will think about it. How, if you ask this question, like, what will you do if there comes a difficult word? So while they search about the answer, their strategies, they will tell you about their method of finding meanings of difficult words. So what they're doing, they're planning. They're threat controlling, road mapping, you know, threat control, role mapping, they're trying to see what problems can occur, how they can control them. 
and they can think about the writer. Can you tell me who wrote it? So they will scan. They will look for, in the reading, they will look for that particular name of the writer. So they will scan the reading. So during the reading, what we have to do? Planning, monitoring, controlling, and evaluating. So uh, while reading a story, students can face many problems, like there are many characters. They can't remember details. There is overlapping information, unknown word, comprehension. But as a teacher, what I can do, I can give them these strategies. I can tell them to, to categorize characters, make notes. I can provide them graphic organizers to remember details. I can tell them how to create links between overlapping information, different events. Setting, time, a rising action, climax. So I can give them a, a kind of a schema where they can create links between events, characters, start and end. And then I can tell them how to understand the context, making lists, using dictionary is to understand un and to comprehend what it is not said, what's not, what not, what was not explained in the story, but they have to infer, they have to build mental images. So in this way, we need to prompt, trigger students' imagination. Uh, after reading, how uh, metacognitive instructional model can help us. The final stage is assessing, assessing one's own reading experience, reflection. So ask students to grade their pace. Let them think about their own speed of reading, their own understanding. Uh, encourage them to tell you about their enjoyment level, the level of difficulty, how difficult the text was for them. And let them explain the strategies. They want to strengthen, that they, they learn and they want to strengthen them. Strategies they want to abandon because they didn't help. Strategies that did not fully work because of the problems in the environment, which they want to amend, which they want to control for future. Uh, they did not have time. There was uh, distraction, so many things. So finally, you can ask them uh, for their suggestions. Um, for the writer who wrote the story, uh, you can ask them their own ending of a story to making them uh, to think, to enable them to think more independently. So, uh, steps for metacognition instruction. Introduce, present the skill, present the strategy explicitly, describe it, what it is, how it can be used, demonstrate it, show them. Number two, sell. Sell the idea of metacognition. Explain the benefits. Explain the benefits of intentional use of thinking of their own thinking process. Number three, generalize. Elaborate on how the skill or strategy can be used in other contexts. How they can apply, how they can pick up the good things and apply them and on others. Practice. Provide specific and structured opportunities for students to practice the skill or strategies, right? Create chances for them. Create chances for them. Um, very structured activities, activities, specific ones for students to practice that skill. And finally, uh, provide guidance, give them feedback, on how they use this strategy. Um, and make correct. In conclusion, here we come to an end. Uh, so metacognition enables learners to be independent thinkers, self-sufficient problem solvers, and confident researchers. Thank you so much. I know I took uh, a lot of time. Uh, I took a late start. There were some problems, but here we are. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Fayaz. That was very enlightening. We have the Q&A time in the next five minutes. Uh, if anybody would like to speak to Mr. Fayaz or pose a question towards him, you can do it now. The attendees can open their mic now and communicate with Mr. Fayaz directly.
I, I would love to hear if, if uh, some of you are already using strategies. I think there are more of thank yous and saying informative session. Uh, I think you've explained it so well that we are still into that. All right. <laughs> Trance, in fact. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ramanduras. Uh, I have a question. Uh, uh, yes, Judy. Better cognition, I, uh, I can use it with the teenagers too? Exactly. It can be used, it can be used, uh, like if you read the literature about that, you will see that it, it can be used in different subjects and at different levels. Uh -huh. I got uh, metacognition can be applied mostly in project project based uh, project uh, based teaching and instruction where you actually leave a lot of time uh, for students to think of a problem think of a solution coming up with the strategy how to solve that and then coming up with the final product they present the final product and then uh, you see it and then you analyze it or they themselves uh, talk about their own learning process Thank you it can so be applied much. on any stage. Thank, Thank you, you so much, you. Yeah, very nice. Yeah. Uh, okay. Great. Hello. 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 Thank you, Mr. Fayez. You said that teachers can. Yes, Ma. Yes, thank you. You said that teachers can give instruction to explain their lessons. On the other side, to what extent can we say that giving too much uh, instruction? may hinder students' critical thinking. How do we, uh, I mean, how do we reconcile between students' creativity and teachers' instruction? Uh, actually, it depends on the way you design the activity. The way you design the activity. It's, uh, you, it's up to you. You can make it implicit without saying it, uh, without saying it like uh, openly to students. as we lost your voice yes i can't hear him you can do you, uh, can you hear me thank now? you thank you yes now yes yeah you, you, you told me that uh, i can make it implicit yes i understand thank you yeah, you can make it implicit uh, and you can actually design the activity in such a way that it opens the way for creativity for students uh, to be independent learners. Yes, thank you so much. That's insightful. Thanks. Thank you. Do we have any more questions at this moment before we end the session? Yeah, how would you like to get the presentation? If you send me the presentation uh, uh, on the email, will you the yes, Julia, the session is being recorded and it will be posted on our website in next 24 hours and the link will be shared with your certificate of attendance. If you could all kindly use the link provided in the chat box to register your attendance, to get your certificate and the recording of this webinar. The feedback link will also be sent with your certificates. Do we have any more questions for Mr. Fayaz here? Oh, yeah, I have, I have uh, some suggestion. I asked you to have all. Yeah, yeah, yeah please, Mr. Julie, carry on. I would like to get the presentation to my email or, or in order to... Uh, as Ms. Maria explained, yeah. Okay, yeah. as Ms. Maria explained, uh, the uh, the recording... Okay, thank you. Thank of this you. webinar is going to be available. And, uh, and like, you, you can access it anytime, yeah. I hope so. Thank you for so much for your head. Thank you so much, doctor. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot. So I can see some comments here from Nilofer. Thank you so much. Right. Okay. Thank you, Maha, for liking the session. Um, um, uh, 
if I talk about my own self, I always use these kind of questions which allow, which allow students to think about their own learning process. So uh, you can you can also create some kind of rubrics, simple simplifying or extensive kind of rubrics where you can invite students to grade their own learning to grade their own thinking process uh, that that can be done in, in, in across across uh, you can say that um, subjects and levels as well. Great. Thank yes, you. Julia, you can. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Fayaz. It was really enlightening and very eye-opening for some of us. And I hope we will be able to implement this in our classrooms in the near future. Uh, thank you so much once again for everybody to being part of this webinar today. And we hope to see you in our future events. So uh, check out on your emails. There will be a big session of our first year anniversary on the 20th of August. And uh, do try to register and follow us on social media. Thank you so much, Mr. Fayaz, again. And we are honored to have you at our platform today. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.